All right, we're going to get started. Uh, it's two minutes after 7 p.m. Eastern time. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, my name is Shadi Reyes. I am cardiologist at Detroit Medical Center. Center. I am uh, privileged with the co-host and our uh, cardiovascular service line at DMC, Dr. Kenton Zer. He's a CV surgeon <clears throat> and uh, director of the cardiovascular service line of uh, Detroit Medical Center in Michigan. Um, this is our heart to heart series uh, put together by a group of uh, cardiologists at uh, DMC uh, um, uh, Medical Center. And um, thank many thanks to uh, Elise Bennett who helped us in launching this a year ago and for uh, Sherry Alvarado who helped us also getting CME. So this is now a CME activity and you can claim your um, one hour activity at the end uh, of the webinar. You're gonna receive an email either tonight or tomorrow to do a survey, see how we are doing, what topic you would like to hear, and also a claim your one hour. Again, uh, I'm privileged to be with Dr. Kenton Zer coming to you uh, live from Detroit Medical Center. This webinar is recorded. Um, this is, if, if any point, at any point you have any questions, use the chat box uh, to um, send us a question. With that, we'll start with the video introduction. is a CME activity, uh, you're going to receive a survey after the uh, event today and or also tomorrow to remind you to fill the survey for uh, the event. With that, I'm really privileged to introduce uh, the co-host of this series, Dr. Kenton Zer, to kick this year 2022 with a webinar uh, that's really talking about a very important topic. I was privileged to take a sneak peek at his slides. Dr. Kenton Zer is the best storyteller you can meet and yearly you can spend hours with him uh, telling you about the history of surgery, about people. It's really a phenomenal speaker, and really, I'm 100% I'm sure you're going to enjoy the webinar. Thank you again, and Dr. Rosario, you can share your slides. I hope I have the right presentation. Thank you so much, Chadi. Um, I was privileged to be at some of the institutions where I got to overlap with some of the greats that were part of the history of my own subspecialty. And I always like to say, medicine changes and cardiac surgery is a classic example of it. The, the profession or the subspecialty is about as old as I am. It started coronary artery bypass grafting started one month before I was born. So I've been able to witness some of the events and, and also interact with some of the people who were responsible for the events that started at all. I'm gonna talk about a few landmarks in cardiac surgery. Some of them are very, very simple and some are much more complex. Early on in 1938, Dr. Robert Gross in Boston got the idea to close a patent ductus. Now, a patent ductus is a congenital opening which exists between the pulmonary artery and the aorta. And if it doesn't close when a child's born, there's pulmonary overflow and patients do poorly. In contrast, a lot of congenital ailments exist where not enough blood flow is getting through the heart into the lungs. And therefore, the opposite of a patent ductus exists where there's not enough flow. And could you create a new ductus kind of an operation? That became the Blaylock Tausig shunt in 1944. And then, in order to not just palliate these procedures or these defects, we needed a heart lung machine that was able to both oxygenate the blood and to pump the blood so that they could take over the work of the heart and lungs while we operated on them, those organs. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about a, an ingenious way of doing that using the patient's parents as the heart lung machine, like C. Walton Lillehy did in a series of 54 in 1954. Now, this is what a patent ductus is. But believe it or not, in 1938, surgeons didn't have the courage to open up the chest and tie this thing off until Robert Gross did it. And this is, a, this is Robert Gross 
surgeon in chief, Boston Children's, born in Baltimore, and in 1938, he ligated a ductus. This launched all of what we do. And now you can see surgery was done differently back then than it is now. Where's the anesthesiologist? Where's all the sterile uh, procedure? In fact, this guy isn't even wearing a surgical hat and he doesn't know how to wear the ma mask up on his nose like we've all learned during the COVID. So you can see not only did things progress from a surgical perspective, but also about the way we do things and the sophistication that we do things. Now, Johns Hopkins Hospital started out like this. It was three old style buildings on the east side of Baltimore. Now, if you see a photo of options, you can't even see these buildings because they're surrounded by skyscrapers. But this in the late 1800s became a think tank for how to fix uh, disease processes. And I'll talk about a few of the people that came from there. And like I say, I happen to be fortunate enough to have spent nine years training there and then five years on faculty later on in my life. Now, one, I must mention one particular thing that really changed vascular surgery and, and everything that we do within blood vessels, and that's heparin. Heparin is an anti, anticoagulant, which when we give it IV into the bloodstream, it keeps the blood from clotting. It also keeps the blood from clotting if we pump it through a pump. And Jay McLean and William Henry Howell in 1918 discovered it. Now, Jay McLean was a medical student. He was working in Howell's laboratory. And as things go, he spent his entire remainder of his career trying to tell the world that it was him and not Howell that developed heparin. Nevertheless, it, heparin was developed and it changed our subspecialty. But this is an interesting editorial that Jay McLean wrote to Circulation, in, and it was published in 1959 after his death. And he talks about how he determined how to discover heparin. It's just interesting, but I also find it interesting that it says this is as far as McLean progressed because he developed the fatal illness and died in 1957 here, and he never finished his editorial. But we still have heparin. Now, Helen Tausig was a woman in, from Boston who came to Hopkins as a pediatric cardiac cardiologist. And she had a clinic full of these patients. And here you see a Frank Netter drawing showing a tetralogy of flow. I'm not gonna detail what the intracardiac defects are of a, of a tetralogy of flow, but the manifestations are club fingers, blue lips, and a cyanotic body because not enough blood flow is getting to the lungs. Now, remember I told you earlier that Robert Gross figured out how to stop the patent ductus and stop extra blood flow from getting to the lungs, which was abnormal after an abnormal non-closure of a patent ductus. But in these patients, if you could create a ductus, then you could provide more blood flow to the body and decrease their cyanosis. Now, Imaging was a real problem back then. We didn't have catheterization. In fact, they didn't even have standard chest x-rays. So they used fluoroscopy. And here's a picture of a Tetralogy of Fallot infant. And you can see the classic boot-shaped heart. And this is how they made diagnosis. They didn't have echo. They didn't have catheterization. And they had to use their stethoscope. And they had to use fluoroscopy. Now, another part of this duo was Alfred Blaylock. Now, I mentioned Tausig. She's a cardiologist. She's not a surgeon. To do a surgical procedure, you need a surgeon. Enter Alfred Blaylock. He received his MD from Hopkins. He went to Vanderbilt. He finished his training at Vanderbilt, and he did pioneering work on hemorrhagic shock at Vanderbilt. And one of the, one of the models that he used was a dog model to create pulmonary hypertension. And that will play a role because that effectively, that model becomes the blaylock Tausig shunt. He accepted a position as surgeon in chief at Hopkins in 1940. He was 38 years old. In fact, he was younger than several of the chief residents. He made a comment when he moved that he thinks he has to get rid of a few chief residents up there because he thinks they're older than he is and may know more. This is the news clipping of him appointed to succeed Dr. Dean Lewis as chair of surgery at Hopkins. Now, what's very important in this story is Vivian Thomas. 
Vivian was an African-American lab assistant for Blaylock. He couldn't go to medical school due to his finances. And he was mopping the floor in Blaylock's lab and Blaylock recognized him as a bright gentleman and trained him up in how to run the lab. And he became Blaylock's primary lab assistant. He was technically gifted and he was very creative. And in that laboratory, he developed the model for hypertension in dogs, which was cutting off the subclavian artery, sewing it on the pulmonary artery to overflow the lungs. And in the reaction of those lungs was to, to, be, to have hypertension in the lungs. So when Tausig came to Blaylock and talked about whether or not he had any ideas about how to get more blood flow to the body of a cyanotic child, Vivian Thomas's operation was the operation for this tetralogy of flow art. And this is what it looks like in a drawing. You can actually get by without the blood flow to the arm because there's enough collaterals here around the shoulder that you can cut it right off, sew it to the right main pulmonary artery and provide more blood flow to the lungs. Now this is a palliative operation. It's not fixing what's going on in the heart, but it's fixing the problem of blood flow oxygenation to the body. Dr. Dr. Tausick had a few comments interviewed by Dr. Vince Scott, who I, who I will show you later in a photo. Must have given you some added hope. Yeah. Uh, what, what, what were your thoughts at that point? Well, before that, I'd been taking, uh, if oxygen closed, it would uh, nitrogen open it. And, but I hadn't got very far. Mm -hmm. But as soon as he did it, I immediately. See, I'm not a surgeon. I can do anything as much as you be a non surgeon. And if you are to do these things, I immediately thought, well, if you can close a ductus, why can't you build a ductus? And that that would help these children and keep them alive. Right. I didn't realize how much it would help them. Yes. But did you, you propose that to Dr. Gross, didn't you? Yeah. Then I went up and it was in 39, after he'd published his paper. And yes. After that, and my father was getting on, I went up and proposed it to Dr. Gross. And of course, he was in the first flush of success and brilliance of closing it up. He said, oh, yes, I built many of them. That's OK. She means I close. Said, I think it'd be a great help he means for close. my child. He was so enthusiastic at building a ductus, he thought nothing could be as stupid. Enthusiastic about closing a ductus. Yes, yes, yes but but closing a ductus. Yes. That's why, why put one in? Yes. I mean, that, that just seemed to him the most illogical thing that you could think of doing. Well, that must have been a little discouraging to you. Well, then I thought, well, my father also at that time, he was older, and he asked me what I was doing, and I said, seeing what the chances were of working in Boston. He said, don't come where you're tolerated. Go where you're wanted. Stay where you're wanted. <laughs> that was very generous of him. And I went back and waited to see who was coming in in surgery. See, we had no chief of surgery there. Right. This was, a, in, well, about four, 1940, wasn't yes, it? Yes, into 1940, you Dr. see. Dr. Blaylock came in 1941. Uh, well, then, was it at, when after Dr. Blaylock closed that patent ductus, uh, what, what, I, you, you kind of began to push him, didn't you? The... I kicked into him and I said, Dr. Blaylock, I stand in awe and admiration of your surgical skill, but the really great day will come when you build me a ductus for a cyanotic child and not when you close a ductus for a child who had a little too much blood going to the lung. Oh. And he gave a sigh. He really thought he'd done it. And he said to me, when that day comes, this will seem like child's play. Well, that was there. Who's, who's interviewing her? Vince Scott. Vince Scott, you told me a story about him, right? Yes, I will show him a little bit later. He's one of the pioneers of the artificial valve. He's the one that uh, discovered that pyrolytic carbon was a good uh, coating for artificial valves, published it in science in 1963. Huge contribution to, uh, to the medical landscape. Well, the day did come. And it had already come because Vivian Thomas had already been doing this operation in dogs. And indeed, they brought it to Hopkins. And Anna the dog was the first operation that, they, that Vivian Thomas did in the lab. And it was the first long-term canine survivor of a Blaylock Tausig shunt. And here we see Alfred Blaylock performing a Blaylock Tausig shunt. And classically, on every patient, that he operated on, Vivian Thomas stood behind him offering advice about how things should be done. The first patient was 
Elaine Saxon. And this is a this is a Leon Schlossberg drawing showing the severed subclavian artery being ready to be sewn to the pulmonary artery. This is how it looks completed. And this is Elaine Saxon with a scar under her arm for a left-sided blaylock tausig shunt. Now I'm gonna show a clip. This is a surgical clip, so it's a little bit bloody and it's gonna be Alfred Blaylock without narration. So I will narrate it. It just gives an example of what they had to work with. They had rudimentary instruments. This is a five-year-old cyanotic child with oxygen saturations of 50%. You can see a significantly clubbed fingers here, all 10 digits. And when he opens his mouth, you see that his lips are blue. They're just showing his functional status, but when he rests, you will see that he's heaving for oxygen. Very uncomfortable, distressed. His whole body is hypoxic. And like I say, his lips and his tongue are blue. Now, this is because he's not, because the tetralogy of flow and abnormality does not get, let him get enough blood flow to his lungs because of the pulmonary stenosis. So the answer for this was to palliate him by giving him the blaylock tausig shunt, which was to take away, to take the flow away from one of his arms and then sew that into the pulmonary. Now you can see here, they're using a scissors they're not using electric cautery. They didn't have those things. They didn't have the techniques we have. Here we have a rudimentary syringe. He's checking oxygen saturations. Now they're getting vessel control. Here Schlossberg provides a drawing. And he's, they're isolating the pulmonary artery. Gonna make a hole in the pulmonary artery here. And now he's sewing the subclavian artery to the pulmonary artery. You can see the needles are large. The suture is not as good a quality as our proline is now. And the clamps are basically rudimentary clamps. But there you see the completed procedure. And what's remarkable is what this child looks like after this procedure. You see his lips? They're pink. His whole body has changed. You can see he's sat, satting just fine. It was a miracle. You see here how many people came to watch. I think I counted there are 14 surgeons watching him perform here at Hopkins. They became international celebrities. A Canadian blue baby arrives to Hopkins for an operation. Surgical history is made by the Hopkins pair. He's an honorary member of the Royal College of Surgeons. They were honored by the premier of France, Winston Churchill, invited him for a, for a meeting. Karsh took photos, classic photo, stylish tie, cigarette holder, here's Blaylock. And of course, Tausik had to be photographed in her element examining a child. And later on, history righted itself a little bit with Alan Rickman playing Alfred Blaylock and Mose Def playing Vivian Thomas to talk a little bit about something the Lord made and how Vivian's, um, Vivian's contribution to this story. It's worth watching. As I said, this was palliative. It didn't fix the holes inside of the heart. So for that, we needed something called cardiopulmonary bypass, which in layman's language is a heart-lung machine. Enter C. Walton Lillehi, the chief of cardiothoracic surgery at the University of Minnesota. To bypass the heart, one needs a basic understanding of physiology of circulation, a method of preventing blood from clotting, which we have with heparin, a pump to pump blood, and finally a method to ventilate the lungs, or to ventilate the blood. This is Lillehi, and this was his idea. You take, a, you take the patient, you use his parent, whose blood is compatible with, as an oxygenator, you run the tubing through a mayonnaise industrial pump, you pump it in the child, you can bypass the child and you can operate on the child. He did 54 of these, 27 survived. So he had roughly a 50% mortality. He never lost a parent, but it wasn't really feasible um, to do. You can see here one of his cross-circulation 
uh, pictures. Now, the person you saw interviewing Dr. Tausig, that's Dr. Gott, he's here. You see this person here, this is Norman Shumway, the father of heart transplantation. He'll play a role later in my talk. I also like to point out here, here's the heart lung machine, the parent who is relatively unattended while everybody's concentrating in the operation. But as you, know, as you can imagine, blood is not always compatible. Not every child has a parent that can function as a heart lung machine. Therefore, we need something that will work better than this. Now, I do want to play a clip from one of the early pioneers that I came, that, that I found. This is F. John Lewis. He was one of C. Walton Little High's lieutenant, and he just talks a little bit about how things were in the early days. It was a uh, uh, special time in the history of surgery, I think, for uh, uh, things became possible that had never been possible before. During due to the army experience, blood transfusions became much safer than they were uh, due to the fact that after the war, some physicians decided to specialize in anesthesia. Anesthesiology became much better than it was. So it was possible to do long operations. Now, I mentioned I was fortunate enough to be in a couple places where things started. Not a lot of people know that the heart lung machine started in Detroit. This is Dr. Dodrill, who worked with General Motors, and he came up with a device that looked like this, which was a pump. Now, he actually had the idea to attach an oxygenator to it, but he never did. So he used this as a pump. And it still required the patient to use the patient's lungs. So it wasn't a true cardiopulmonary bypass machine, even though he had that idea. This is a photo of that pump. They made four of them. This sits in the lobby of our heart hospital here. And apropos is the GM building behind it, because GM uh, sponsored his research. And also, uh, you can tell GM did because it looks like a car engine. Now, Dodrill did four patients, three lived, and these were valve procedures using the pump, using the, using the Dodrill pump to bypass the, cha the strong tr pumping chambers of the heart to get the operation done. Good successes, never went much further with it, but it started in Detroit. Now, enter Dr. Gibbon. Dr. Gibbons from Philadelphia, when he was a medical student, he watched a woman die of a pulmonary embolus. And he realized in his head, if you had a heart lung machine, you could put a person on the machine, you could retrieve the pulmonary embolism and the patient would live. And he doodled it on a paper. This was in 1931. This is the machine he ended up coming up with. He worked with IBM to do it. And as you see, it looks like an early IBM computer much like Dodrill's first pump looked like a car engine. This is him performing a procedure. And these are, this is his series. Now, if you look on the right-hand column, it's a dismal series. He did six patients, five died, one lived, and that, and that one that lived was 18 years old. Unfortunately, Gibbon was very discouraged with his series and never did any more patients. But there were others in the world that recognized his genius. And one of them was John Kirkland from the Mayo Clinic. And he took the machine and he modified it. He called it the Mayo Gibbon machine. This machine is now restored and is in the Mayo uh, Museum if you go to Rochester. And it much, looks much the same like the original Gibbon machine. It had a big screen oxygenator where blood would percolate down the screen and the exchange would happen. It had a heater cooler in it and they could do bypass. Now, this is one of Kirkland's early operations. Here you see the machine to the right of the slide, how big it is behind. And this operating room is actually where our cardiac surgical offices were when I was on faculty at the Mayo Clinic. I always felt good about sitting where Kirkland had done his first operations. These are a few notes of his operation he recognized the importance of how much fluid is given and how much is taken off, what the hematocrit is, 
and what the pump time and the cross clamp time were. And he put together what was, the, I think, one of the first IRBs. He got together all the chiefs of the divisions and he said, we're going to do eight patients. Then we're going to get back together and we're going to discuss our experience and how it can be improved upon. And then we're going to decide if we're going to continue or if we're not going to continue. So he did. He did eight patients. And he had a 50% survival. And they decided the experience was valuable and they would continue. And this is really what started the modern era of being able to fix defects within the heart, including valve replacement and such. It became a phenomenon. The clinic was on national TV. They advertised for, they needed a huge amount of blood to prime the pump because it was so big. So they sought, sought donors from staff in the surrounding area. And they were, and, and open heart surgery was off and running. I'm going to digress a little bit and talk a little bit about the operation that we do the most, and that's coronary artery bypass grafting. Up until now, all the emphasis had been on fixing congenital defects. But by this time, uh, cardiologists began to be aware that blocked coronaries were a significant problem, and myocardial infarction was a significant problem. But the story for this doesn't start in the United States. It starts in Russia. There was a gentleman named Vladimir Demikov who recognized that coronary artery disease was a real problem. And he recognized also that you could do without your internal thoracic artery on your chest wall. So in 1953, without the heart-lung machine, he was able to anastomose uh, the first mammary artery or left internal thoracic artery to the LAD in three dogs, which survived for more than two years. His work became known to another Russian named Vasily Kolosov. Kolosov, here you see in the diagram, exactly did the same thing. Did a lem off-pump lima to LAD, and he did it in humans. Now, he had significant resistance from the cardiology community. In fact, everyone was unimpressed. Kolosov's article appeared in the United States and the American surgeon said the opinion concerning management of surgical treatment for angina pectoris, as expressed in this paper, is at variance with the concepts of many surgeons in the United States. And indeed, in, in Russia itself, the Russian Cardiology Society from St. Petersburg said the surgical treatment of coronary artery disease is impossible and has no prospects for the future. There was a guy in the United States that didn't believe this, and this story is not well known. It was published by, uh, by Igor Konstantinov, Robert Gates. He did the first coronary artery bypass grafting in the United States, and it was a sutureless connector, which you see the cartoon on the right, where he connected, uh, he connected a mammary artery to the right coronary artery. Now, this is before the days of angiograms even. So he didn't even really even know the patient where the patient's blockage was. But by the EKG, he felt like it was the right coronary and he did the bypass. He did it in May 2nd of 1960. Unfortunately, his career did not pan out as a heart surgeon. They didn't even know what he did. The notes say the exact procedure which was performed can only be guessed. When Igor Konstantinov wrote to Gates and asked him why, what happened to his career in regards to bypass grafting, he says, you wonder why I didn't pursue the subject. The reasons are several. Our medical colleagues were violently against the procedure. We literally had to snatch the patient from the medical department. They were definitely against a procedure they considered not only highly experimental, but also unwarranted. And the chairman of his own department thought he had too much work and suggested that he do something else. Well, he, so he became a vascular surgery surgeon and never did any more coronary artery bypass grafting. But his work became known to the Cleveland Clinic, to Rene Favillaro and Dudley Johnson in Milwaukee, and they picked it up. And 
we have all the other people that have contributed to the innovations which have resulted in cardiopulmonary bypass success and more importantly, coronary graft bypass grafting success. We have improved vascular techniques, suture instruments. We have magnifying loops so we can see what we're doing. We've learned that arterial grafts fare better than venous grafts. And therefore, we do more arterial grafts on the important vessels that need to be grafted. We have a good heart-lung machine that results in the still bloodless field. We have solutions to protect and arrest the still heart and make the heart still. And we now have tests that can pre predict whose patients will do, which patients will do well, and even where we need to put the bypass grafts. And this is the mainstay of our operation. This is an internal thoracic artery or internal mammary artery taken from the chest wall. We can take one from each side. We sew it to the vessel in the heart. We generally, it's, it's such a reproducible procedure that we effectively put the same number of stitches in each anastomosis. And if we sew this well, 95% of these are still open in 20 years. And that data is shown from the Cleveland Clinic to be true. So this has become a very durable operation. It's the mainstay. And I've given you a little bit of the history of how it got started. Open heart surgery has exploded. We go back to those original days, which I talked about, and we were talking about one, two, three, four, ten 10 patients. Then by the 1960s, we had Harkin and Star ball, ball valves, uh, uh, ball valves, and we see 10,000 worldwide cases. By 1970, we had coronary bypasses being done by, by Rene Favalero and Dudley Johnson. We have 50,000. And I'll talk more about transplantation, but you see here, we're now into the exponential growth of millions of cases being done worldwide based on the pioneering history that you see here in this slide. We also have major advances in cardiac meds, lipid lowering drugs, anti-smoking campaigns, preventive cardiology where people know now the diet and exercise is good. We have imaging techniques which are vastly improved. And we have Dr. Al Reyes's entire subspecialty of balloon dilatation and stents. And we have electrophysiology devices called defibrillators. And I'm talking to you a little bit about the advances in cardiac surgery. The prevalence of disease is going to increase, but not because we're not, we're having significant decline in mortality due to cardiovascular disease. It's dropped off considerably over the last 40 years, as you see by this red line. But because our population is aging, we see these decades, we see a dramatic increase in prevalence of US heart disease as people are getting older. And here you see the aging population on the top. It will double by 2050. So we have, now I'm gonna switch gears a little bit to talk about a whole other area that we're now working on in both cardiology and cardiac surgery. And it's an exciting development. And I'll show a little bit of the history related to this. There are 5 million patients with heart failure. It's an increasingly common problem in patients over 65 years of age. About 50% of patients with heart failure, newly diagnosed, die within five years. There's about a half a million per year and 250,000 patients with heart failure die per year. Well, there's not too many therapies other than medications for advanced heart failure. I'm going to talk about both of these. Now, transplantation is the dream. It's the absolute dream of the generation of heart surgeons which preceded me. I always say it's one of the more simple operations we do because it's really sewing in a circle five times. SVC, IVC, left atrium, aorta and pulmonary artery. But there's a lot that goes with transplantation. And some of these early overlapping pioneers were contributory. And this is the main one. This is Dr. Norman Shumway, who you saw on an earlier slide, gazing expectantly over the back of C. Walton Lillehy doing a cross circulation case. This is him as a young intern. I think it's his internship year. He might've been a mid-level resident when he was at the University of 
Minnesota. Now he went on to Stanford where he did his pioneering work in transplant, and I'll show some of those slides, but I'm gonna show a few, just one, one recollection from F. John Lewis, who was one of his co-residents. was um, strongly under the guidance and influence of our leader, Long and Esteem. And um, it operated uh, in a way, I suppose, a little like the army, at least, he was the commanding general and we were the soldiers and he called it a benign dictatorship. Norm arrived uh, with a, a group of other interns who seemed to be attracted to the place, but skeptical. And Norm always uh, seemed to have a position of uh, um, a uh, objective observer or commenter on things. Well, Norman Shumway went on to be that skeptical observer and experimenter at Stanford. And we in the cardiac surgical community see him as the father of transplant. The world knows Christian Bernard was the person who put the world's first heart in. But look here, notice the dates. November 1967, we have a letter to the Journal of American Medical Association saying, we think it's the way is clear for a trial of human heart transplantation, says surgeon Norman Shumway. We've achieved a degree of experience in the laboratory and we're confident. Although animal work should continue, we're more or less at the threshold of clinical application. Barnard had worked in Norman Shumway's laboratory. He went back to South Africa and he contributed by having the courage to do the first. Now, Shumway, what's lost in the shuffle is that Shumway did one of the one of the second or third. And actually in Detroit, Adrian Kanchowitz did one. He was at Philadelphia at the time, but he did one soon after that. So everybody jumped on board. Now, Shumway was the one that done the pioneering work in immuno in, a, in immunosuppression. So he he went on to kind of build the Stanford experience and to establish transplantation. And this is him operating at Stanford. And this is the media claim that came with heart transplantation in the United States. Basically media parked at Stanford to get the opinion of these doctors that were doing the cases. And this is Shumway. And I like to show this because this is just his attitude about how people contribute to medicine and the development of historical uh, uh, events and things that change our subspecialty. And that's the best thing you can possibly do is to provide an opportunity for the other people to come by and to make their suggestions and their improvements. And then you see we're learning too because everybody, every resident that comes through the program will change things maybe just a little bit. Sometimes it's not as good, but most of the time it's better. So we keep refining our methods all the time because of these bright young guys that are coming through and having a chance uh, to make these contributions. It's really interesting to me how these early guys were the guys that had the concept that the rising tide floats all ships. And they were willing to accept the genius around them and, to contri and all the contributions of the various people. And so much came out of those early programs, which were basically think tanks for the future. And this is one of them. This is Norman Shumway, the man you just saw, but he's assisting his 30, I believe six year old uh, junior attending, Dr. Bruce Wrights to the world, to do the world's heart lung, first heart lung transplant at Stanford. Dr. Wrights then later became my boss and chief at Johns Hopkins uh, after this, later on after this procedure. Now, there are not enough transplants to go around, and that's a subject of a lecture in and of itself. So what are the other options? Well, I always say the treatment for a dead pump is a new pump. And if we don't have enough regular pumps, we need artificial pumps. So how, how did some of that start and what did they look like? Well, this is what they looked like. I always tell the patients it was like putting a teapot in them. It was huge. You can see it here in actual size. 
This was the Novacore, which was the first one, a solenoid electric pump. This was a pulsatile uh, pump called the HeartMate 1. And this is what it looks like in a surgical basin. Those who are surgeons know how big this basin is. It literally is an enormous device. And as you see here, this is what it looks like with the heart is here, the blood drain, you leave the heart in, this is an assist device for the left ventricle. Blood drains out here, runs through the pump, gets ejected back into the aorta. But you have to basically open the patient from stem to stern and you can't put it in a small person. So this was not an option for most women and even small men, it was not an option, but this is what we had to work with. This would give somebody about a year, but not much more. So as I always say, things get smaller. Some people might recognize, recognize this. This is the world's first pacemaker. Now we have pacemakers, which are about the size of a silver dollar that go under your skin, but it started out like this. So as you saw this big blood pump, now it's smaller. Here it is implanted in the belly. Now we have a smaller version called the HeartMate 2. And this is what the HeartMate 2 looks like. The dissection is much smaller. Now we have devices which are even smaller than that. They pump the entire left ventricular blood supply. They're continuous flow pumps. They pop in the apex of the ventricle and you don't even have to open up the belly to put them in. And this is what they look like in a patient. So there, you showed us a picture of the pacemaker. Yes. Um, is it also Lily High worked with Medtronic or somebody right. in Minneapolis for the well, development of pacemaker? Exactly. You're exactly right. That was a gentleman named Earl Backen. And Earl Backen had a elect electronics or electricity um, repair shop that he worked out of a garage. And Lily High got him involved to make pacemakers which were external because they couldn't that were that would work with wires sewn on the heart because they couldn't externally shock these small kids they would just scream in pain so he got him to create the uh, pacemakers which were which were would work that could the, the small amount of electricity could be transferred and that back in company became Medtronic is so, it the picture you showed us earlier with the big gentleman pushing a big machine, big battery? That was his first uh, pacemaker, Earl Backens. Mm -hmm. Interesting. When we see the, when those pumps, here you see it, this is a, a slide from the University of Pittsburgh, just categorizing the number of pumps that were trialed. Pittsburgh was a, was a, a think tank for how to, in, 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 how to implant portable pumps for a long period of time, and they still are. And the person who was pioneering that was Bart Griffith, who is now the gentleman that pushed the world's first pig heart in a human at the University of Maryland. But this is a slide from Bart Griffith's experience when he was at University of Pittsburgh. When they had the big pumps, this is how many they did. When they got the smaller pumps, it exploded almost exponentially. And they were asked to try multiple different kinds. So now we actually have numerous devices that we can implant that actually last not months, not years, but many, many years. So I'm going to show in the remaining time, I'm going to show just a few glimpses of what people can think about of some kinds of techniques which have not yet hit the clinical scene, and maybe they never will or maybe they did and then they were withdrawn for further refinements and here they come. So this is a device, it's a sutureless connector. Remember I said that the first bypass was done in the United States by Getz in 1962? Well, he used a sutureless connector. When I was at the Mayo Clinic, a company came to us and asked us to experiment with their device which was a sutureless connector 60 years after the original ones were done. And I'll show you, a, it's I believe a two minute clip of what a bypass graph looks like using a sutureless connector on a pig to do a bypass graft. So this, a pig doesn't have a good saphenous vein. So this is a dog saphenous vein that we're using for the experiment. You can see we're mounting it on a rod 
and the sutra of the connector is at the end. And this is the beginning of the of our time doing this. So we had to do some things by hand. So we've loaded it on that rod, and we have a coring device which retrieves the plug of the aorta from the pig. We're making a hole right in the aorta. And I'm going to put my finger over that hole so we don't lose too much blood. You can see I've already put a graph on here. I'm going to put another one on just to show you how easy it was. It's the click of a ballpoint pen. It's a perfect anastomosis. It doesn't leak. Now we're going to do the distal. Remember, this is an almost real-time video. I put a hollow tube through the saphenous vein. Then I'm going to clamp it so it doesn't move. Now I'll take a pre a prescribed diameter three corner knife and make a small hole. Now I'm going to take a dilation device and I'm going to enlarge that hole to the size that I want for the anastomosis, which is the size of the sutureless connector. Now remember I said I put a hollow tube through this so I can pass a catheter based device much like Dr. Aureus would in the cath lab, and I can pop it through and load it. Now I can take the corner, I can make a hole in that right corner, which I've isolated. I can dial it up, dilate it up the same way. I can put the device in, pop it in. I can put it perpendicular so it doesn't catch the back wall. I can inflate it to eight and a half atmospheres. And now I have in less than two minutes, I have an off-pump coronary artery bypass grafting times one. This is another example of what people can dream of. Dr. Giovanni Speziali was at the Mayo Clinic, and he devised this idea for flail leaflets, mitral valve regurgitation from ruptured cord strings that hold the mitral valve to its tethering and the pap muscles on the valve. This is a cartoon from the Mayo Clinic showing how you might want to do that. You could go through the apex of the heart with a rod and you can grab that leaflet edge and then do a half hitch over it, pull it down through the apex and under echo guidance, you could tie it to the apex, providing new Gore-Tex strings and alleviate the mitral valve regurgitation. Now, can you actually do that? Yes, you can. And this is what the company's advice does. It device looks like now. This is being trialed in Europe. The, the trials are now being done in the United States. And this is an example that Dr. Giovanni Speziali and I did in the lab in Pittsburgh, looking at what it looks like in a porcine model. We cut the cords and then we reattached them and we see no mitral leak on echo and we see the artificial cords flapping here going to the apex. So we will see this in the future, which is a minimally invasive way to fix the mitral valve in a certain number of patients. Now, this is something that now has pretty much completely taken standard aortic valve replacement. This has been a, this is percutaneous aortic valve replacement. And this is a culmination of all these years of history. And it's in conjunction with the cardiologists, the interventional cardiologists that have pioneered these techniques for doing such. You go from the groin with a balloon to dial up a stenotic aortic valve. Then you take that same wire and you pass the valve which is loaded on a stent type structure and you expand it in place. And presto, you have an aortic valve replacement. And this is what it looks like now, which is do being done in most big cardiothoracic and cardiology programs in the country. And this is what it looks like. You rapidly pace the patient so the va valve doesn't get dislodged. You blow it up in place. And then you confirm that your position is good by putting dye. Now, not only does that dye show there's absolutely no leak back in the ventricle, but it also shows that the vessels that feed the heart, the coronaries, 
are patent and open. There are thousands of these procedures done per year, and these patients now don't stay the requisite one week after surgery with an open chest. They go home the next day with a valve replacement. So this is, this is a culmination of a lot of the years of history that I've showed kind of in brief. As I said, things get smaller and things get, can get real small. So those initial teapot size pumps, we now have a pump here located on the bottom, which is an impella pump, which will pump five liters of blood, which is your whole cardiac output, going through the aortic valve, taking blood from the ventricle and ejecting it in the aorta to relieve patients that don't have a strong enough um, ventricle to pump blood. So while these are temporary devices, this is just an example of where we're going with some of this technology in the future. So in summary, I would say that we have seen many, many medical and surgical advances that have re resulted in decreasing mortality from cardiovascular disease. And over the last 50 years, it's been a significant reduction. People are living much, much longer, but we can't give up. The prevalence of heart disease will increase significantly over the next four to five decades because of the aging population. And we, we know statistically the Medicare population will double in the same time frame. So I think the future's bright for patients with cardiovascular disease. We will continue to see more specific cardiovascular drugs we're gonna see more continued development of imaging techniques. We, we're gonna see significant surgical advances conti to continue to be made in the areas of coronary and vascular disease and valvular disease. And I showed you some of them, the idea of sutureless connectors, the idea of more percutaneous ways to fix valves. We're gonna see innovative surgical therapies for treatment of patients with heart failures, smaller pumps, more reliable pumps. We are already seeing it with atrial fibrillation with the Watchman device to occlude the left atrial appendage. We have clips, we do that in the operation, uh, in the operating room with virtually all of our patients who are at risk for atrial fibrillation and, and aortic disease as well. We're gonna see the refinement of minimally invasive surgical techniques through collaborative research. And you saw an excellent example with Dr. Kaushik Bendel's uh, uh, lecture last month, looking at minimally invasive approaches to the mitral valve. And as I showed you in my one of my last examples, we have the emergence of percutaneous valve therapy. We already have it in force for the aortic valve. We're starting to see the beginnings of it for the mitral valve. I, I believe that's my last slide. Thank you very much for your attention. Professor, thanks so much. This is uh, one of the time, I think this should be like a grand round uh, presentation about the history, where we started and when we are. I mean, this is something I would never hear or read about from anywhere. Uh, a lot of history, a lot of innovation. You mentioned something interesting and you said back in the day uh, when Dr. Tussing and uh, Blalock the, the field was open. You can innovate and the space is open. So this is the, um, the, it was a big opportunity to develop and create and bring new things. Do you think you still have this large window for innovation as, or you think it's getting narrower as we exhausted every possible option? Well, without being too political, um, we have a significant, we have, we need some rule changes. We have, um, like for example, if you want to modify your left ventricular assist device pump, a small portion, it's difficult to do so without doing a whole nother multi million dollar randomized prospective trial to show that the new pump is better mm -hmm. than the old. Yeah. Common sense would just say it's a simple modification. We should not have to spend those millions and millions of dollars. And of course, those millions and millions of dollars get passed on to the consumer. We've seen multiple devices, some of which I showed, which have gone away 
because complications were not allowed to be dealt with in a simple revisionist way because of FDA constraints to getting those things to the market. Mm -hmm. so, so that remains a significant impediment to the old days when you could just decide to do it to someone. Now, what does, you, you know, our ways protect our patients. So we need to have rules in force that do limit us doing foolish things to our patient population. But I think innovation is significantly limited. It takes, it, it, it takes millions and millions and millions of dollars to bring a new heart pump to the clinical arena. Um, whereas if we could allow a lot of the hoops not to have to be jumped through of experimentation that's been done before. Um, another question, do you see minimally invasive surgery is the future uh, replacing the open heart surgery? Well, yes and no. I see that if you can do the same operation, the exact same operation with the same results, in a minimally invasive way, so the patient goes home sooner and suffers less, great. But if it takes you twice as long on the heart-lung machine, therefore your complication profile is higher, or your operation is suboptimal because you can't see what you're doing, then the answer is no. So we have to be sensible about our minimally invasive approaches. We tried this many times, like for example, off-pump heart surgery is an example. It, be, it looked very clear for a long period of time that it was going to be better. But in multiple randomized studies, the results weren't as good. We couldn't sew as well. The heart was moving. The field was not bloodless. So most surgeons do not do that anymore, even though there was a little economic benefit. So we're back to a still bloodless field where we sew great anastomosis and 95% stay open for 20, for 20 years. So... So I think, like I say, the answer is yes and no. Now, when you have a procedure that Dr. Kaushik can do a minimally invasive march, the patient goes home in two days and the same procedure is done, great, have at it. I think um, I would like your take on this and you have only one minute, is um, the innovator and all the names you mentioned, these people, were th they thought outside the bo box, they pushed the envelope, they learned new technique, and really they started from the animal lab, like yourself, into the human being. Um, but there's a lot of personalities as well. I mean, as you know, we, we shared briefly about it, like Lily Ha, he's a legend as well. I trained at the University of Minnesota. They has a statue in the university in the division of cardiology. Definitely, he made a lot. But it's at the same time, uh, he was so focused uh, where his career was 99% of his life. Do you think like these people, the, the innovator, the, the people who really bring new things, especially in the surgical arena, um, still exist nowadays? Yes, I do. And, but it takes a team and it takes a perfect storm. And I showed you some examples where there was not a perfect storm to get it done. Robert Gates did one cardiopulmonary bypass, bypass grafting operation. By all rights, because he pioneered it, it should have been his career. Now, he had, a, he had a good career. He went back to South Africa. There's laboratories named after him. He studied why giraffes don't get a stroke when they put their head down to drink. And when they put their head up, they don't pass out. Um, he had a good career, but it wasn't in cardiothoracic surgery. Gibbon was so discouraged by his results, he didn't continue. But Lillehei had the perfect storm. He had Owen Wangenstein as the chair of surgery, who, was, who wrote a, put a note on his door the night before, on a, on, virtually on a napkin, pinned it to his door about the first cross-circulation operation done ever in the world, and all it said was, by all means, Walt, proceed. <laughs> so, and who came out of that program? Vince Scott, Norman Shumway, F. John Lewis, Clarence Dennis. Uh, just a cadre of genius surgeons. And the same thing happened with Blaylock and Tausig. Blaylock trained 45 residents. 35 became chairs or chiefs wow. of divisions. 
So it creates, it, it needs to have the right environment, but it still can happen. We see it from time to time. There are other examples. I just gave a few. So, so it sounds like back in the day, it was a solo effort. Nowadays, it's more of a team effort to bring something new. Is that correct? Well, no, I, I, I'm, I guess I'm saying the opposite. I'm saying you need a strong leader. So in that sense, you had a Lilahai, you had a Blaylock, you had a Kirkland, but you also had the people around them. And I didn't talk about those people around them. Kirkland had his chiefs of the division, which contributed to that series. Blaylock had his 40 five residents over a long period of time. Shumway talks about how he learned how to progress his, his the field via the contributions of the residents. I saw that video is really eye-opening for somebody legendary like him. He could have claimed all the fame. Absolutely. And, yeah, but still he recognized the people he trained. Exactly. And while they were training that they contributed to the growth of his program and the development of transplantation. These are important lessons in life. Absolutely, beyond the surgery. Dr. Zara, thank you so much for a wonderful webinar. I mean, really, we never had this much of attendance for that long throughout the hour, 40 people um, throughout the hour that uh, represent engagement, quality, as well as the information you're delivering. This webinar and the others, and this is the one we did before last, last month, gonna be hosted all on the YouTube channel the DMC Medical Group has. You can at any time you uh, go back and check it as well and for resources for your student, resident, colleagues, and so forth. Also, if you have any, any urgent cardiac need as well, uh, please uh, call this number, the 888-54-7028. And also, more importantly, if especially when this pandemic, call the transfer center for any cardiac emergency. Uh, Dr. Zer and his team for uh, ECMOs, uh, urgent surgeries, cabbage dissections. We are always available and his team always available. With that, again, a final reminder, this is a CME activity at the end of the day today or and tomorrow, you're gonna receive an email reminding you to complete the survey. Please be honest with us, tell us what you think about the webinar and what topic you would like to hear in the future. We have a, a full schedule coming for the whole year. Thanks again for Elise Bennett and also uh, Sherry Alvarado for helping us putting this program together, recording, putting a CME effort into it, and also producing and putting it again available recorded. With that, thank you again for joining us tonight. Dr. Zer, many thanks for your hard work on these slides and the history lessons you gave us today. My pleasure. I hope you have enjoyed this DMC Medica Group video. To find more content, webinars, and physician videos, visit dmcmedicalgroup.com.